Hey guys, so it's been a while since my last Sansa Stark video, and I've been reading a lot of comments on it, and it's given me a new perspective. And the more I think about it, the more I find that maybe, just maybe, I was wrong. That maybe Sansa has outsmarted me. Maybe, just maybe, she has been a genius this entire time, and neither me, nor you, nor any of us have actually noticed. Just not in the way that we thought. Guys, this is gonna be a good one. Here we go. So before we begin, huge thank you to everyone who has subscribed and jumped in on these videos. Your comments, your likes, all of it means a lot to me and really pushes me in order to come up with some new content. And so let's get back into it. So the fate of Sons of Stark was unfortunately probably some of the worst of any character in Game of Thrones. And I mean, this is Game of Thrones, so that's really saying something. But Sansa really has a horrible time of it. I mean, she starts off after her father gets killed as being a prisoner and a victim in King's Landing. And while she's there, she's psychologically and emotionally tortured the whole time. And things really don't ever get better for her, at least not for a while. Because after escaping from King's Landing with Littlefinger, she then finds herself in a situation where she is once again being emotionally and psychologically tortured, except this time with a little bit of sexual harassment sprinkled in. And to be fair, she's no longer being physically abused like she was in King's Landing, but I mean, this is hardly an upgrade. Anyways, from there, she is tricked into marrying Ramsay Bolton, and then her former experiences with psychological and emotional torture really do fully shift over to regular old physical and sexual torture. I mean, she really does not have a good go of it throughout the series. And even the biggest Sansa defenders out there would probably agree that at the end of the series, what she needs is not a crown, it's a therapist. The Queen of the Queen of and the story that we get at the end of the series is that Sansa has managed to remain pure of heart and has become a gracious and benevolent queen to the North. But this really has never resonated with me because I couldn't help feeling that Sansa didn't really deserve the throne. I mean, after all, despite the fact that she keeps on being called smart, she really hasn't demonstrated it. Sansa thinks she's smarter than everyone. She's the smartest person I've ever met. But what if I'm wrong? What if Sansa has been outsmarting everyone, including me, this whole time? As I told you, this is going to be a good one. Would I let you down? See, I guess we have to start at the beginning here. So back in season one, we find out that Sansa is pretty naive and vain, trusting probably the worst possible people that she could. But even then, back in the earliest episodes of Game of Thrones, we find out that Sansa, in fact, has one gift. And that gift is masking. See, as early that we've ever seen Sansa, she appears to be able to hide her true intentions and does have the sense of social awareness that is required in a good queen, or more importantly, a good politician. But then, Sansa gets put through a rigmarole of torture at the hands of her captors, the Lannisters, Littlefinger, and the Boltons. And I know I'm going out on a limb here, guys, but maybe, just maybe, maybe years of psychological, physical, and sexual abuse are not good for your mental health. I know, I know, crazy, crazy, crazy. Absolutely nuts. But that brings us to Sansa's character in season six. And her character has been put through the ringer. A character that's been put through so much, but through it all has been able to maintain her poker face. See, Sansa has learned when to be truthful and when to be dishonest. And she's used that to get out of her situation in the veil. And that is typically the point where most of us have assumed that Sansa stopped using it. Because after she escapes to the wall, surely there's no reason for her to be lying and deceitful anymore. I mean, she's with her brother. She can be honest. She can, you know, let her guard down. But what if she's not? See, through it all, Sansa has been power hungry. That was one of her core attributes going into season one. When would we be married? Soon or do we have to wait? Hush now. Your father hasn't even said yes. Why would he say no? He'd be the second most powerful man in the kingdoms. You left your home to come here, and I'd be queen someday. 
Please make father say yes. Sansa. Please, please. It's the only thing I ever wanted. And through it all, despite everything she has been through, Sansa has always been attracted to having a position of power. Whether it has been in season 1 when Sansa really wanted to marry Joffrey and become queen, or even in season 4 when Sansa basically jumps at the opportunity to marry Loras Tyrell. And she seems pretty okay with the idea of her actually marrying Robin Aaron as well. But through her experiences with Ramsay and Littlefinger, if she's learned anything, she's learned that if she really wants to have power, she needs to take it. And this brings us to the Battle of the Bastards. Now guys, I know I've already talked about this, but Sansa does possibly the most insane things up to and into this battle. But the fact is that if Sansa had just told Jon before the battle that the Knights of the Vale were there and were willing to help, Jon's entire battle strategy may have changed. They may have even been able to win this battle with much fewer casualties instead of the situation we got in which basically Jon's entire army was massacred. Really, Jon shouldn't have even survived this battle if it wasn't for just extreme luck. And the idea of not giving Jon this pivotal piece of battle information while going into the battle makes no sense. I mean, it makes no sense if you wanted Jon to win. But what if you didn't want Jon to win after all? Sometimes. When I try to understand a person's motives, I play a little game. What's the worst reason they could possibly have for saying what they say and doing what they do? Then I ask myself, how well does that reason explain what they say and what they do? And before I forget, the theory is so controversial that I'm probably going to lose a bunch of subscribers. So if you guys are enjoying it, you know, help me out and uh, balance those scales just to... Uh, See, what happens if the two armies that are fighting on the battlefield are both your enemies? If your objective was actually just to defeat both armies, then a much better plan would just be get them to fight each other and then hold your army back for the last moment. And then you could just swoop down on all the survivors who must be extremely tired from this battle. The men we have left are exhausted. Many of them are wounded. They'll fight better if they have time to rest and recuperate. And who is in Jon's army anyways? Because the one thing that every person who's fighting in Jon's army has in common is they're all loyal to Jon. Most of them are wildlings that have no loyalty to Sansa Stark, and the few northern houses that are on Jon's side have sided with Jon Snow over Sansa Stark. Hardly the most loyal that you would really want to keep around. And if Sansa had told Jon about Littlefinger and the Knights of the Vale earlier, Jon might not have gone into battle that day. He may not have been anywhere close to what was hopeless and ran into what was basically a suicide mission. And Ramsay wouldn't have been able to use Rickon because he needed to keep him alive as a bargaining chip. But if you needed the Northern Lords to decide that you were the rightful leader of House Stark, you need Rickon to die. Hell, you kind of need Jon to die too. And my god, did Sansa come really close to having both those things happen in the battle by themselves. A result that would of course meant that both known living male members of the Stark line had died out, and she was the only one left to rule. But guys, I'm not even close to done yet. Because if we think that Sansa's true objective was to secure being the Queen of the North the whole time, really makes us question other certain events throughout the series. And I mean, it does seem like she's very focused on the amount of power that she now has, and she also has a kind of fear about someone possibly coming to take that away from her. It's one of the first things Sansa says to Bran once she finds out he's alive. And Sansa, your brother has finally returned who many people believed was dead. But that's really not what she's concerned about. Your father's last living true-born son. You're Lord of Winterfell now. I can never be Lord of Winterfell. And let's talk about Sansa's behavior throughout the last two seasons of Game of Thrones. In the last few seasons of Game of Thrones, Sansa can be seen arguing with Jon almost constantly. It feels like she disagrees with him in almost every major decision he makes, always being very vocal to voice her opinions in meetings, in front of all the Northern Lords. She doesn't seem anywhere close to as agitated when she's no longer in the meetings. See, when Jon talks to Sansa about these events afterwards, she's quite composed and relaxed. And if her intention was to truly get Jon to change his mind and change the way he's behaving, wouldn't Sansa 
be just as adamant on those points after the meetings were over, unless she wasn't actually trying to overthrow his decisions, just sow a tiny little seed of dissension among the Northern Lords who might believe that she is the one who's right. Sansa is, of course, very good at masking what her true intentions are, and if there's anything that she should have learned from Cersei, and more importantly Littlefinger, it's really how to behave in these kind of political situations. And Sansa starts to really act like these characters on a fundamental level as well. At the end of the Battle of the Bastards, Sansa kills Ramsay Bolton. And while the guy completely deserved it, and we were really excited to see him die, it's a bit weird to see someone who takes this level of sick pleasure in a kill. I mean, who have we ever seen having this much fun torturing their victims when they get their justice? And as for the Battle of Winterfell, when Sansa is seen hiding down in the crypt, something that most Nordeners wouldn't do. It's not something Arya would do, it's not something Ned would do. You know who would hide in a battle? Practically every single one of Sansa's mentors. I'm not going to fight them. I'm going to fuck them. A battle that once again is extremely likely to result in the death of Jon Snow or Brandon Stark. After all, Sansa is remarkably comfortable with using the last male heir to the Stark family name as human bait. I mean, he has no ability to defend himself, really. And even when it becomes finally time for her to get justice on Littlefinger, Sansa is keen to not do this kill in private. Sansa makes a spectacle of it for all the Northern Lords and Knights of the Vale who are in attendance. And why? I mean, Sansa has known that Littlefinger has been guilty for quite some time. Because Sansa knows that Littlefinger is the one who is responsible for Jon Arryn's death. Sansa knows that Littlefinger was the one who pitted the Lannisters against the Starks. And she knows that it was him who killed Lysa the entire time. And yet, when she goes to finally exact her revenge, she does not do it in private. She waits to do it in front of all the Northern Lords, when Jon isn't there, in order to further her role as a leader of the Northern people. In order to push her agenda and make her seem like a better potential queen in the North. And I guess with that, we're brought to the ending. Because despite many close calls, somehow Jon Snow has survived to this point and Sansa is still not quite the Queen in the North. Because even going into the last three episodes, Sansa still has two major problems separating her from the throne. Number one, the Dragon Queen. Daenerys wants to be the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms, and she has a much bigger army and much more support. And as long as Jon remains loyal to Daenerys, the North will never be free. Which brings us, of course, to number two, Jon Snow. Because most of the Northerners are still loyal to Jon Snow. In fact, even following him all the way down the King's Road to the invasion of King's Landing. And if Sansa wanted to be queen, these are both huge issues that she would have to address. And practically the moment Daenerys shows up in the North, Sansa is extremely hostile to her, and seemingly goes out of her way to oppose her and create unnecessary friction between her and Jon. Sansa seems to be constantly working at breaking up this relationship, despite the fact that Daenerys' army is the only thing that's going to stop them from dying. Or I guess you could have just hidden Arya in a snowbank and saved a lot of lives. But Sansa seems dedicated to repetitively trying to drive a wedge in this relationship. And that brings us to the final reveal when Sansa finds out that Jon Snow is actually Aegon Targaryen. And pretty much immediately after finding this out, Sansa finds a way to use this information. Sansa tells Tyrion Lannister about Jon's true identity. And this makes absolutely no sense. Because Tyrion is not loyal to Jon. Tyrion is Daenerys' Hand of the Queen. Why in the world would Sansa ever think that giving Tyrion this information would get Tyrion to support Jon's claim to the throne? Why, why would this ever in any world lead to Jon becoming the king? Is she expecting Tyrion to just give up on the leader he chose and suddenly blindly follow Jon? No. He would certainly tell Varys about this, or at very least Daenerys herself. But what if that was the actual reason Sansa told him the whole time? See, if Tyrion tells Daenerys, a few things happen. Daenerys finds out that Jon's true identity has been revealed, and that secret is going to spread throughout the Seven Kingdoms, and that Jon may actually be the one to usurp her, further driving a wedge all the way to Daenerys' camp and further splitting apart Daenerys and Jon while simultaneously putting a target on Sansa and Arya's back, because, of course, 
They're the only other ones who know the secret. And what Sansa knows above anything else is that Jon would never, ever let Daenerys hurt his sisters. In fact, they're the only people that Jon would ever betray the queen for. I won't ever let him touch you again. I'll protect you, I promise. Then when Daenerys had burned down King's Landing and was on the warpath to force the North to follow her, Sansa really left Jon with only one choice, portraying the ruse the entire time that she was never in control. So guys, there's a really simple explanation that explains that Sansa was smart the entire time, and her decisions actually made a lot of sense throughout the last two seasons of Game of Thrones. Something to explain that she has actually learned from her mentors all along her journey. A very simple explanation. That she has actually become just as much of a villain as the rest of them, becoming willing to manipulate anyone in order to achieve her goals, sacrificing her own people and even her own family members to ensure that she is able to secure the throne for herself. So guys, that's just what I'm thinking. And while the writers of the show probably didn't intend this at all, it's hard to say that it doesn't make sense. But guys, what do you think? Is there merit to this? Is there a chance that Sansa has actually been outsmarting all of us and has truly conned and manipulated her way to being Queen of the North? Let me know what you guys think in the comments down below, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.